morning, everybody. Thanks, Trevor. So glad you decided to be here this morning. Um, we're in this series, Roles, and um, when I think of roles, I think of one is on Sunday mornings. There's lots of different roles. This morning, someone was getting buckets of water that leaked in and vacuuming, and, and there, there's so many roles, people teaching Sunday school and all these roles. But when I, when I think of roles, I also think of, uh, I think of one of my favorite events in the world. It's called Wild Cow Milking. Everybody, anybody ever seen Wild Cow Milking? Just me, huh? Anybody? All right, I see you. I can't see who you are, but I see you. All right, Karen. Oh yeah, Karen. She she's born in my home, or lived in my hometown for a while. But hey, but but this I got to tell you about wild cow milking. And wild cow milking, um, I, I got my my buddies Derek and Daniel Oyster. I got to go with them a few times to this. Uh, it's called the Range Roundup. And in the Range Roundup, uh, there's an event. I didn't get to participate, but I was just a spectator. But in in this event, they do all kinds of stuff like calf roping and wild horse races. But my favorite my favorite is wild cow milking. And what they there's four roles. And everybody needs to know their role in order there to be success. And, and uh, uh, there's, there's a roper, and then there's a mugger, and then there's a milker, and there's a, what I call the tailback. And so in this event, um, uh, the, 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 what you have to do is get enough milk in a, a Coke bottle to be able to dump out. And the, one to, the, fir- the, the fastest one to, to get this in the bottle and get to the end, uh, they, uh, they win. And so the mugger or the, the roper, he's on a horse and he, he rides up and he ropes the, horse, or ropes the cow, this thousand pound animal. And, uh, and then the mugger comes and he's got to grab the, grab the it, it, take the cow by the horn, so to speak, grab its head. And then the tail back, of course, it grabs the tail and has to keep it from wiggling around. And then, the, of course, the milker gets, in, in, in gets the milk in the bottle. And, and man, if you haven't seen this, you need to look it up on YouTube. I'm sure it's on there. Everything's on the internet. But, but look it up and, and, and uh, see that. Not right now, but maybe it's later on this afternoon. But, but the thing is in anything in this world, whether it's, it's Sunday morning church or wild cow milk or, or other things, we need to know our role in order for there to be victory, in order for there to be success, in order for us to fulfill our purpose, we need to know our role. We've been going through the book of Ephesians and um, Joe's brother, Judd, um, he, he talked about a few weeks ago the role of a prayer. And, and it's a very simple thought, but the role of, of a prayer, someone who prays is simply just to do it. And he challenged us to, to, the, with this idea of 77365, that seven, that seven minutes a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, we would just come to the Lord and pour our hearts to him. That the first thing in the morning before we, we do anything, before we, before we make our coffee, before we eat our breakfast, before we look at our phone, that we just get on our knees and give our attention to God. And then and, uh, Josiah, a couple weeks ago, Joe's, Joe's son, um, talked about the role of a leader according to the, the word of God. And he said a, a leader according to God's word is not to r- rise themselves up above others, but to actually to raise others up, if I can say it this way, to empower others. And then last week, John talked about um, uh, the role of, of marriage. And then if I can say it in a broader broader. Uh, context that the role of a relationship, and he said the role of a relationship is, is to one, to reflect the love of God, and to reflect the image of God. And this morning I've been given the task of, uh, of speaking about the, the role of a believer according to the Word of God. We're going to be in Ephesians starting in, in chapter 4, but um, before we get into that, I just want to clarify what we mean when we say a believer. Because the book of James says that even the demons believe, Right? But like even, even a demon, even, even Satan and his cronies believe that, that Jesus Christ is the king above all kings, that God is the almighty God over the world, and they, they tremble at that truth. So the, the, the belief of, of, of Satan and, and, and the demons is very different than the way that you and I believe. So if I could think of it this way, I would say that it is not only the acceptance of it, but it's the submission to that truth and it's the trust in that truth but I can say it this way it's to um it's the idea of bringing myself under if I bring my if uh, the way a a baby uh, uh bird will bring himself under the wings of the mother or the way that that during a, a storm a tornado that we go into a shelter we come under the protection of a shelter or if you think it in terms of a kingdom that that someone would come under the protection under the authority under the leadership of a kingdom so when we say believe that's what we're talking about if I could put it into a simple word it should be up on the screen screen I'd say this or a simple phrase I would say it is the trust filled submission to God's revelation I believe that God has clearly revealed himself through creation, clearly revealed himself through his word, clearly revealed himself mostly in his son, Jesus Christ, who he raised from the dead. 
And it is our trust filled, that means we put our full trust in him. And it's submission, that means we live in submission to, we live under the authority of. It's the trust filled submission to God's revelation to us. And so as we talk about the idea of a believer, I would, if I could start with, with this thought, it's someone who has come under the lordship of Christ and understood that that is the best place to be. I would say that, that, that a, believers are those who have had their, the deepest longings of their soul satisfied by Jesus Christ. Paul, in, in the very last uh, sentence of, of his letter to the Ephesians, he, t- he talks to the believers in this way, that they are those who have an undying love for Jesus Christ. But again, if I could give, give us a phrase to hang on to today as we talk about what a believer is, is, should be up on the screen, that is believers are those who are believing in Jesus. Now, I know that sounds very simple and very like, oh, no, duh. But what I'm saying is, is it's those who not one time long ago that they had submitted or they had, they had put trust in Jesus, but, but right now today they are trusting in Jesus. They are living in submission to who he is. And not only now, but it's a perfect present tense, meaning it's continuing. Not that, not that one day, one day I'm going to, I've accepted it for now, one day I'm going to submit, one day I'm going to trust, but it is the, the believing that now and forevermore I, have, I am trusting in And I'm submitting to the lordship of Jesus. So that's what we mean when we say the believer. And we're going to talk about the role of a believer today. And so first I want to talk to those of us this morning that are unbelievers. I'm sure there's some unbelievers here. And man, I'm so, so glad that you're here. But but if you have not, if you're not living in trust-filled submission to Jesus this morning, I'm inviting you this morning, come to Jesus. Uh, there will be people in the, in the next room back there to talk to you. But, but, but listen, God wants for you to have the deepest longing of your soul fulfilled, satisfied by him. And he has the ability to do that. And so I'm asking you to come, to come and talk to us. Um, come and talk to someone so that you could experience the life that Jesus wants for you. And to the believers, let me say this, is that simply to remember the identity that you've been given. You've been given a new identity, a new status, a, a, new, um, a new position in this world. You have been, listen, given the right to be called a child of the Most High. Remember that, consider it. You have been united with Christ Jesus himself who overcame the grave. You have been given, the, the, actually the favor of God is on your life. Can you believe that, that God's favor like, like, like that this almighty beam, he, 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 his favors on you. Listen, it's not something that you earned. It's not something that you deserve. It's not something that I deserve, but it's been given to us. It's called grace. But, 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 but hear me that, that even though it is by grace, we've been given this position, this status, this identity, there is still an exp- expectation that is placed on us. You think of if, if you were given a job that you didn't deserve, or if you were placed on a sports team that you didn't deserve to be on, or placed in a family that you really didn't deserve to be a part of. But the reality is that in any, even though those things might have been given to you by grace, in any, in the, any family that, that the brothers and sisters, they, they have a role to play in the family. That, that, that every employee, whether he's been given that, that job by grace or not, he has a role to play on every team. If, even if it's been given by grace that you're on that team, you have a role to play. There are some expectations. There's actually effort involved. And the same is true for us that we are, there's, there's an expectation placed on us. And, and that's what we're going to talk about today, the role of those who are believing in Jesus Christ. So if you have your Bible, it's going to be starting in, in, in Ephesians 4, chapter 13. starts this way. He'd been talking about the, the spiritual gifts that are, that are given, um, Paul had. And then he jumps into this after he talks about these individual spiritual gifts. He said, this will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will become, that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. Then he will no long, we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about By every wind of teaching, we will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies. 
so, that, so, so clever that they sound like the truth. Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of the body, which is the church. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly as each part does its specific, special work. It helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. Did you hear the words that were in there? Words talking about becoming more talking about growing, talking about maturity. He says, he says that we may mature in the Lord, that we may measure up to the fullness of the standard of Christ, that we would no longer be immature like children, that we would grow in every way, more and more like Christ, healthy and growing. Did you hear the words of this, this forward motion that we would grow up in Christ? Some of you know my son Judah, and... Uh, and uh, if you don't know him, he'll probably run around here waving at people. But, but, but I, want, I need you to understand this about Judah, that he does some things now that I am expecting him not to do later. Uh, let, me, let me just explain it this way. Is that, that he will walk up to you and he'll say, up, 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 and he'll, and, which means he wants you to pick him up. Which, man, I love holding my son. I love picking him up. I love putting him on my shoulders. I love, I love even, even rocking him to sleep sometimes. I love holding my son. And, 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 um, but, but here's the thing is that, that I'm expecting that, that one day I will hold him no longer. If he's 10, 15, 20 years old and he still wants to be held, there's something wrong, right? <laughs> right? And, and let me tell you this, is that, and if, you're, if you have boys, you probably understand this, but this is just the reality of the situation. But he's going through this phase right now. He's 18 months old and he always is sticking his hand in his pants. I'm like, I'm like, Judah, get your hand out of your pants, boy. Get your hand out of your pants, boy. But here, kids will act like kids, but I'm expecting him to grow, grow out of that. Or, or this is really funny, that, that uh, this week um, I, I, I was going to get him a book. His books are right above his clothes in, on that shelf in the closet. And uh, I said, hey, do you want to read a Good Night, Good Night construction site? No. Do you want to read, a, um, do you want to read Brown Bear, Brown Bear? No. Do you want to read Hungry Little Caterpillar? Hand no. I said, what? Hand no. And I realized he was pointing at the hanger saying, hanger. I was like, man, boy, who you been hanging out with? But, but, but the truth is that, that, that the, when kids are young, they're not able to speak and articulate words in the way that they should so we can clearly understand them, okay? But here's the thing, that, that children, we expect them to grow up. We expect them to one day to think like adults, to speak like adults, to act like adults. And that's, and that's what Paul said. It says, when I was a child, I acted like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. But then at one point, I put those childish ways behind me. And it's the same for you and I, that, that we have a loving father who expects us to grow up in him. Those who are believing in Christ are expected, listen, expected to grow into his likeness. So I have a really important question for you to think about that I have had to wrestle with, and that is this, is, is that do you look more like Jesus today than you did yesterday? Let, 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 me, let me make it maybe a little easier and say, do you look more like Jesus today than you did last year? I mean, seriously, consider that. Do you? Or, or those of you who have been following the Lord for a while, do you look more like Jesus today than you did five years ago? You know, there's this phrase that's going around. Um, be true to yourself. Be true to yourself. In other words, whatever you find to be to what you think is right, what you think is true, what you should be doing, that's just what you should do. Be true to who you are. Let me ask you this. Let me, let me give you this to consider. What would happen if every time Jude was sitting at the table and he threw his fork across the table, I said, oh, that's okay, just be true to yourself. Or every time he hit me or my wife in the face, I, hey, that's okay, be true to yourself. Or I never expected him to quit going to the bathroom in his pants. That's okay, just be yourself. That's, that's, if that's you, be you. Listen, I'm being kind of funny, but I'm being serious that the world will say be true to yourself. Paul says, grow up into the likeness of Christ. How many of y'all like chocolate chip cookies? 
Oh, yeah. Man, I love me some chocolate chip cookies. That's one thing I'll never grow out of. When I was Judah's age, man, I could eat 12 cookies, chocolate chip cookies, and I wouldn't think a thing about it. I'm still that way. I could eat 12, 12, maybe 24 of them chocolate chip cookies. As a matter of fact, my boy Rob here, he brought me a whole bunch during Christmas time and, uh, and uh, surprised me. But anyway, I love chocolate chip cookies. But but I, I was thinking about what if what if someone hadn't had any chocolate chip cookies before and they were weren't too sure sure about the chocolate chips like they wanted the cookie but they said you know what? I think I want to avoid those chocolate chips I don't know about those chocolate chips I, I'm going to try to kind of just eat around them you know, well first of all you'd have a mess second of all that person would have no idea what a chocolate chip cookie is or what it tastes like they would be missing the sweetest part of the cookie I mean after all what's a chocolate chip cookie that doesn't taste like chocolate chips and I can think about our faith, and sometimes we treat our faith like that. Yeah, man, I, I, I want to receive the forgiveness of Jesus. Yeah, yeah, I want to receive the grace and the peace that comes with that. But then we avoid maturing in Christ. And I'll say this, is that growing up into the likeness of Christ is the sweetest thing about our Christian faith. That if I miss out on that, I don't really understand what this thing about faith is. I mean, well, after all, what is a Christian that doesn't look like Christ? And so, so my, my prayer for you has been, and, and my, my pleading to you is, is that if you reflect on that question, are you becoming more like Christ? And you think, man, I'm, I'm not. I'm not. I, I, my, my encouragement to you is, man, just quit eating around the chocolate chip cookies. Man, embrace what God has called you to. And so, so here, here's my first point. point. Be willing to receive all that Christ wants for you. He wants you to grow into his likeness. Be willing to receive all, not just some of the parts, but all that Christ wants for you. And in order to do this, it's going to take two things in, 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 my, in my estimation. That is an open mind and a soft heart. That, I, that my mind, I have to be willing to change my mind at times. I have to be willing to do that. I have to have a, a heart that is able to be moved. That, 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 my, that my train of thought, my way of thinking can't be so concrete, so set in stone that no matter what, it's not changing. But I have to be open to God changing my way of thought. I, I must allow the truth. This is what it means to have an open mind. And that is to, that I allow the truth of God to move me into right thinking. I allow the truth of God to move me into right thinking. And then when I think about having a soft heart, what I'm saying is that, is that, that I am able, that, that the, 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 the truths and the realities of the experiences that I have are able to stir something inside of me, whether that be anger or joy or compassion. But that, that to have a soft heart, soft heart means I allow the God-given emotions that I have to move me into right action. Listen, if you're a believer... You're a child of God. Man, our loving Father has so much that he wants to pour out to you. He wants for you to receive. He wants, he wants you to receive inspiration from him. He wants to inspire you. He wants to encourage you. He wants to discipline and correct you. He has so much that he wants to give to you. But the question is, are you ready to receive from him? Is your mind open? Is, is your heart soft? What is your attitude towards the Word of God, the Spirit of God, and the people of God? Sometimes we, we get in these trains of thought, and we've been in them so long, we think, well, this is the only way I know how to think, that, 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 that this has got to be true because I've been believing it or thinking it for so long. Or we get in these lifestyles, and we say, well, you know, this is just the way that I've been living for so long. There's, there's, no, uh, there's no getting out of this, that this is the way it was. This is the way that it will be. This is, this is maybe my generation. This is my culture. This is just what I know. But those who have an open mind and a soft heart are ready to receive whatever the Lord has for them. What is your attitude towards the, the, the Spirit of God and the Word of God and the people of God? These are the three primary ways, spiritually speaking, that God gives to his children. So when it comes to the Word of God, 
Do you come to God's word just to kind of validate what you think you already know? To confirm the beliefs that you've had for so long say, oh yeah, that's, the, that's exactly what I'm talking about. Or do you come to God's word saying, God, correct me. God, discipline me. God, God, show me the blind spots that are in my life. Change me, oh God. Our heart, our prayer must always be, come Lord Jesus and move my soul to repentance. Come Lord Jesus, change my way of thinking that I may become more like you. Listen, I love God's word. I, I, I really do. And I, I've been studying for a long time and I love, I love to understand more of the story of God. I love to, to memorize scripture. I'm not very good at it, but I love to do that. I, I love, I, I love to um, just, just be able to know the big picture. I love to know more of God's story. But, but, but the, 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 the bad thing is sometimes I don't come with an attitude of an open mind and a soft heart. Sometimes I just come to God's word just to learn. And listen, learning has so much value. To come to understanding has so much value. It is good to come to God's word to learn. But listen, it is better to come to God's word to be changed. We need to be changed. We need to come to God's word with an open mind and and a a soft heart. Let me ask you this. When was the last time, again, I want you to think critically about this. When was the last time... You allowed the word of God to change your mind about anything. Can you remember? Can you remember the last time that had happened? That you read something in the scripture and said, man, I've been wrong about this. There's something that I need to change in my way of thinking. And listen, the spirit of God is at work in the life of the believer, but I have to be willing to be led by him. I have to give allowance to the Spirit to move me to the place that I need to be. So, so in a like manner, when was the last time that you allowed the Spirit of God to convict you of your sin? That you felt the stirring in you, so you're like, man, I need to change the channel. I need to turn the TV off. You, you felt the stirring. You said, okay, I need, to, I need to do something different on a Friday night. You felt the stirring. You said, oh, I need to speak. I need some, to speak some truth to this person. Or, or man the Spirit of God convicted you and you were broken over your sin. When was the last time for you? Listen, God has also given us not only his word, not only his spirit, but he has given us people around us. Man, I'm so thankful for my small group. You know, that, that I, there's people in my life who are concerned for me emotionally, concerned for me physically, concerned most of all for me spiritually. And I need someone around me so they can point out blind spots in my life. And listen, there in verse 15 and 16, Paul talks about being able to speak the truth in love. And when I come to these, these what we call small groups, just people that, that are relationally close to me and who care for me, then I got to be ready to speak the truth in love when I'm led by the Spirit. I have to be, listen, I have to be ready to submit to the way God wants to work in my life when the people of God either correct me or encourage me. Are you ready to receive the fullness of all that God has for you? Are you ready to receive his discipline? Are you ready to receive his correction? Are you ready to receive his instruction? A lot of times pride and selfishness and even shame can keep us from becoming the men and women that we were created to be. We make excuses, we justify ourselves, we point the finger and the, the reality is that no discipline is fun at the time that it's happening. It's, it's happening. It never is. Even, even if later we reflect and say, yeah, they're right at the time. We're like, man, man, I don't want, I don't want to be hearing that right now. Listen, uh, we do tutoring, uh, some of us at the church, two days a week here. And, and then sometimes those boys drive me crazy. And, and, they, and we, I, I try to correct them. And then, and then they just get really, really mad or, or, they, or they, they get really, really disrespectful. And I sit them down. I tell them this all the time. Look, I want you to become... I want you to become good dads and good husbands and good men. And so I'm correcting you because I want what's best for you. I'm, I am begging you to receive correction because it is for your good. And so this morning, I want to say God is trying to correct his people. Is your mind open to his correction? I'm begging you, have an open mind and a soft heart that you may receive the correction of the Lord. So this is what I'm going to do right now. I'm going to pray. I'm going to read. The reason I'm going to pray is just to, to get 
to, that we could ask God to give to reveal the blind spots in our lives. So there's, a, there's a fairly big uh, section of scripture we're going to read right now, but, but, but it's because God's words are always better than my words. And I believe that God's world, words have the ability to change our minds and bring conviction and that his spirit works alongside his words. So I'm going to pray and then I'm going to read starting in, in verse 17 of, of uh, chapter 4 of Ephesians. So let me just pray and ask God to speak to us. Awesome Father, God, we, we humbly come to you and we're asking God for you to speak to us. God, we, we need your correction. God, we need your discipline. God, we want to become more like Jesus. God, that's so why I pray, Lord, that as you speak your words over your people, God, that you would just bring encouragement where there needs encouragement. Lord, bring conviction where there needs conviction, God. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So let me read this, starting in verse 17. With the Lord's authority I say this. Live no longer as the Gentiles do, for they are hopelessly confused. Their minds are full of darkness. They wander far from the life God gives because they have closed their minds and hardened their hearts against him. They have no sense of shame. They live for lustful pleasure and eagerly practice every kind of impurity. But that was not the way you learned about Christ. Since you have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him, throw off the old sin, your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Put on your new nature created to be like God, truly, truly righteous and holy. So stop telling lies. Let, let us tell our neighbors the truth, for we are all parts of the same body. And don't sin by letting your anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while you are still angry, for anger gives a foothold to the devil. If you are a thief, quit stealing. Instead, use your hands for good work. And then give generously to others in need. Don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear him. And do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way that you live. Remember, he has identified you as his own, guaranteeing that you will be saved on the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness and rage and anger and harsh words and slander as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, and be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. And imitate God, therefore, in everything you do because you are his dear children. Live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. He loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. Let there be no sexual immorality, impurity, or greed among you. Such sin has no place among God's people. Obscene stories and foolish talk and coarse jokes, these are not for you. Instead, let there be thankfulness to God. You can be sure that no immoral, impure, or greedy person will inherit the kingdom of Christ and of God. For a greedy person is an idolater, worshiping the things of this world. Don't be fooled by those who try to excuse these sins. Don't be fooled by those who try to excuse these sins. Don't be fooled by those who try to excuse these sins. For the anger of God will fall on those who disobey him. Don't participate in, these, in, in the things that these people do. For once you were full of darkness, but now you have light from the Lord. So live as people of the light, for this light within you produces only what is good and right and true. There's a, lo are a lot of things in there that we can meditate on, reflect on, but, but I pray that you would consider those things and you would be open-minded and soft-hearted that, that God could change you. So the first point is, is we talk about our role and that, that is that we would become mature, maturing to the likeness of Christ. The first point is just be willing to receive all that, all that Christ wants for you. And the second is this. Live in proper response to him. Live in proper response to him. And too many times we, we live out of reactions instead of planned responses. Someone says something that we don't like, so we just react. Someone does something that makes us mad, so we react. We don't get what we want, so we react. Well, there's something that we want we don't have, so we just react. But the people of God, as is, is we as we are growing into the likeness of Christ, we are to consider 
how Christ would have us respond. Sometimes I need to start thinking before I speak. I need to, I need to, to stop justifying my reactions and start planning my responses according to God's truth. Listen, God, the God that we serve, the God that we are to respond, respond properly to, he's an emotional being. What I mean is he, he, he is, he is soft hearted. Listen, I'm not saying he changes. God never changes. He was the same yesterday. He'll be the same today. He'll be the same tomorrow in his perfection. He has no need to change. He is perfectly good, perfectly holy, perfectly righteous, perfectly loving, but, but he is able to have his emotions stirred. That's why Paul says, I don't know if you saw that, in, in, in chapter 4, verse 30, it says, do not bring sorrow to God's spirit by the way that you live. Do not grieve the spirit of God. If I could just, just, just say it this way, he's saying, don't break the heart of God by your way of life. How often do you consider that? By the things you think, by the things you do, by the way you talk, that you can actually break the heart of your loving father. And then if we could go on from where we stopped reading there, in verse 10 of chapter 5, it says, carefully determine what pleases the Lord. Carefully determine. If I can say it this way, he's saying, he's saying consider, consider what, what would make Jesus happy. Think about what, would, what Jesus desires and then, and then do that. Consider, carefully think about what would bring joy to Jesus? By the things that you do, by the things that you say, by the way that you live. There, there's a guy named Dan that I, I worked for for a little bit. And one time Dan was, was reading the Old Testament. As, as he was reading, he was reading about the anointing oil that, that Moses, um, that, that, that God created Moses to, to, to mix up and then, and then use. And as he was reading the ingredients, one of the ingredients was cinnamon. So Dan got to thinking as he's reading that, he's like, well, then, then, uh, uh, God must like the smell of cinnamon. And so Dan, he puts, he, he, what he would do is he would have a, a candle, a cinnamon candle that he would burn in his office all the time, understanding that, that as a believer, the presence of God is with him. And if the presence of God is with him, he thought, well, well, I want the place that I am to be inviting to the presence of God. Man, I think, wow, that's incredible. I want to read God's word like that. I want to read God's, God's word so, so practically. And so literally and so humbly that I'd say, okay, what does God like? And how am I going to incorporate that into the very small details of, the, of my life? That, so even the atmosphere that I am in would be an inviting place for the Spirit of God. I'm going to uh, borrow an um, a, uh, illustration from a, one of my favorite preachers, but um, I'll say it a little different than he did. But, but I... I trust that the Lord of God is the highest authority in my life. Sometimes we, we say that we do, but then we don't live like we do. So, and I'm not saying that we get it right every time, but, but, but I'll say this, is that if, if God's word says, says white dudes from Oklahoma have to learn the Macarena and wear a ballerina suit, then by golly, that's what I'm going to do. Dino thought that was funny. <laughs> but I'm, I'm being serious. Like, 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 like I know it's a, a silly analogy, but what I'm saying is that whatever God, if my, if my mind is open, my heart is soft, then I want to say whatever God you want me to do, no matter how ridiculous it sounds to everybody else in this world, man, that's what I'm going to do because I trust you, God. I want to be conformed into your likeness. And I, most of all, most of all, I want to please you by the way that I live. And listen, if we're going to please God by the way that we live, it's going to take our consideration. We're going to have to actually stop and think about all the areas in my life and say, okay, the way that I discipline my, my children, is, is, is it a way that would please God? The way that I love my wife is a way that it please God. The, what I'm watching on, on YouTube or on the TV or what I'm, what's on my Snapchat, whatever, is, is, am I living in reference to the fact that I want to please God in everything that I do? I have, to, I have to carefully consider and I have to investigate. I actually have to look in the word of God and say, okay, what would please the spirit of Christ? And so what that means is there's going to be some things that I'm going to have to add to my life. 
It could be a reading plan. It could be a habit. It could be, it could be, a, it could be a, um, a service opportunity. I don't know what it is, but there could be some things. If I really think about it, that there's some things that I need to add to my life if I really want to please Jesus. And, and on the other side of that, there's probably some things in our lives that we need to get rid of. If we think, man, there's some things in my life that, that if I'm honest, I know that it grieves the Holy Spirit. If I'm honest, then there's these, some things, maybe it's something physical, like something in my pocket or something in my truck or something in my home that I need to just get rid of. It could be something digital. It could be, it could be something on my Facebook. It could, be, it could be an app that I have. It could be a Netflix series. There's some things in my life that I might need to get rid of in order to please Jesus in order to do what is pleasing to him. So this, this is the role of the believer. It is that we would grow up in every way, Paul says. Grow up in every way. That we would allow God's word and God's spirit and God's people to have its way in our lives. That we would allow the work of God to work in our lives in such a way that every day we would look more and more like Jesus himself. That we'd think like him, that we'd speak like him, that we'd act like him. So let me wrap this up. Let me ask you this. Are, are you allowing God to have his way in your life? Are you allowing God to have his way in your life? Let us invite the discipline of God. Let us permit the work of God. Let us not quench the spirit, despise the word, or reject the reproof of, reproof of God's people. That is the discipline of God's people. Let us grow up in every way. We must think more like Christ. We must speak more like Christ. We must des desire the things that he desires. We must spend ourselves the way that Christ would spend ourselves, the way we spend our money, the way we spend our time, in all that we initiate, in, in, in all the ways that we respond. Let us look like, let us grow up into the likeness of Christ. Let us grow up in every way into him who we have trustfully submitted ourselves to. And let me leave you with this last idea, and that is there's this preacher um, that, that was talking, that I heard recently that talked about his best thought. I was actually talking to my dad about this last weekend. What he, he said, what is your best thought? And I want to challenge you with that. What is your best thought? The best thing that you could think about in the morning when you get up or at night when you're, about, when you're getting ready to get in bed or, or, or when you're going throughout your day or as you're way, laying asleep at night, what is your very best thought? This preacher said this, and I tend to agree with him. He said, my very best thought is my personal accountability to Jesus. That I would consider in all my ways, what is going to please Jesus? What, 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 are some, what are some things that might grieve him that I need to steer away from? My best thought is my personal accountability to Jesus every day. So let the word of God have its way in you. My prayer is that you would let the spirit of God have its way in you. It's, it's my prayer that together, that in every way we would grow up into the maturity of Christ. Let me pray. Lord God, I, I thank you. God, I just thank you for your word. I thank that you care. You're a, a father who loves us so much that you would choose to discipline us, that you would choose to give us instruction. God, God, help us, God, just to humbly submit to your leading. God, we are thankful, Lord, that we serve such a good God and, and we need your help, God, that our, our, our hearts will be soft and our minds will be open. God, I, I'm asking that you to bring convic conviction to all of us so that our minds would change and our emotions would be, in, be stirred and, Lord, we would look more like your son every day. It's in the powerful name of, the, of Jesus Christ, our Savior, that we pray. Amen.